adrenaline just got to me. I just jumped over that board and I just saw like all those guys just standing there, the victory guards. And I just started like looking at them. I put my chest out. Like I actually had no idea what I was doing. A bit disappointing, you know, after the game. Obviously a few that were a bit uncomfortable to look at and yeah, just takes away from a special moment. Um, and then after the game, my phone was just blowing up and thinking I was just getting message after message after message. Like I was recording like us singing songs and stuff and I was seeing people putting monkey emojis and stuff. Like, Whoa, what's going on? Like people were just like abusing me. A lot of other heavy abuse. Just quickly before we get into the podcast, if you could like and follow on whichever platform you listen to, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. The adrenaline just got to me. I just jumped over that board and I just saw like all those guys just standing there, the victory guys. And I just started like looking at them. I put my chest out. Like I actually had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Going in the gym late night and I just remember like those were great times. In the moment, I was probably thinking like, I don't want to do this, man. Like I just want to get to where I want to get to. Now I look back, I'm so happy those moments happened. Those are the things that you need to cherish the most. It was quite strange and I was very defensive of my mum. I didn't want her to have another partner. I was in like three different worlds at home with mum, she was white and then I felt black and then at school everyone was white again so like it was strange. That's where the messages started. I was recording like us singing songs and I was seeing people putting monkey emojis and stuff on my things and what was going on like people were just like abusing me. I don't fully feel South Sudanese, I don't fully feel Australian, I don't fully feel English. Kissini Yangi professional footballer, a man not afraid to be true to himself in a sport of robots. He's honest, vulnerable and open, discussing the challenges of an unsettled childhood, remaining positive throughout injury and how he stayed focused on the goal while trying to enjoy every minute of the journey. He's a person that works hard, day in, day out. Cassini was raw and extremely insightful. He's displayed immense resilience throughout his life has shown extreme mental strength despite all of life's challenges. So sit back, relax and enjoy. And remember, life isn't black or white, it's lived in the grey. Well, good afternoon. My name's Ali, the host of Something in the Grey. I'm joined here with Cassini. How are you today, Cassini? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me. So I thought where we can get started is, obviously you had a pretty unique childhood. Tell us about your uh, childhood and growing up. Um, yeah, it was pretty interesting, um, considering my mum's from the UK, my father's from South Sudan, but I was born in Adelaide, so I was a bit of a different kid to everyone that I grew up with, mostly like white kids. Yeah, and it was a bit different for me as well, finding myself, I'd say, because half my family's black, half the family's white, so like, I spent half my time with white people, half my time with black people, and I wasn't really sure where I, where I, fit, where I fit in, um, so it took me a while to kind of like, find myself as I was growing up which was interesting for me. So yeah, it was a very interesting childhood. I know you spent some time in South Sudan where, you're, where your dad's from. Like you were saying, it can be a bit of a tricky thing because sometimes you might be considered too much of one ethnicity or the other ethnicity doesn't take you on. You might seem too black for the white mm-hmm. part of your family and then for the white part of the family, you might feel too black. Mm-hmm. How did you develop um, that security within yourself in terms of where you stood? I'm not quite sure. I think going to South Sudan was very eye-opening, for sure, because I got to see how my father grew up. I got to see another perspective of the world um, that I hadn't seen at a very young age as well. I think that really opened my eyes. And and when I came back to Australia, I was, I'd say, a lot more proud of who I was and where my family came from. So, yeah, that that was something that really changed my life and I'm very grateful for, I'd say. When you were in South Sudan, because your family moved in 2008, is that correct, yep. for a few yep. months? Yeah. When you were in South Sudan, what were some of the, the main differences that you noticed besides the obvious cultural ones? Um, it's crazy. Everything's different. I, where I went was to my father's village, so it wasn't like a capital city or anything, so it was really like in the bush. There was like one road that went there, and then that main road cut straight through the middle of the village, and then it was just little like footpaths around there was no like no one had cars there was no brick houses everything was mud huts straw um no one had electricity so when the sun went up everyone woke up when the sun went down everyone went to bed you had to walk like a kilometer to get water from like a borehole you'd like pump the water into like a tank and that water was used throughout the day for drinking showering everything so it was like it was crazy because i i came from living in Adelaide in Prospect. I had two parents that both worked, so we were quite wealthy family. I went to school in the city, so I was 
in the middle of the city every single day at school and stuff like that. Um, so then going there was, it wasn't so much a, a big culture shock for me because my dad had shown me pictures and stuff like that. So I kind of had an idea of what was going on. But then living there for, I was there for about nine months was, yeah, different level. I could imagine there would have been quite a difference in the mentality of people as well over there. I feel like in just in my experience, when I've gone back to the Middle East, for example, a lot of the people were a lot happier there because although they didn't have as much, they were content with what they had. And I feel like here in Australia, in, in Western society in general, there's always that need to be more ambitious. You always need to have more and more and more. Is that something that you noticed as well? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I was in school at the time, but I didn't go. I went to school for about one or two days and the school wasn't very good at all. So I ended up spending most of my time herding cattle with the boys that stayed home. Um, and those guys loved it. Like they'd get up in the morning, go herd the cattle, come home. The whole day was spent just like chasing after cattle, throwing rocks at mangoes to get mangoes down from the tree and stuff like that. And they were, yeah, everyone was so much more happy. Like they didn't have what we have back here, like iPhones and all that type of stuff. But, you know, they found joy in playing little games with rocks and like building slingshots and stuff like that. Yeah, so it was very interesting. And then you come back to Australia, you come back to Adelaide and then you see people complaining about things that, you know, shouldn't be complaining about. Yeah. How did you feel when you have you know, had that experience that a lot of people haven't had or been exposed to and then you come back here and you see that there's so much want for more and so much lack of uh, gratefulness? Yeah, it made me so much more grateful for everything I had. I think when I first came back to Australia, I was still a kid. So like, even though I experienced all of these things and it did have a little bit of an influence on me, I was still kind of stuck in that mindset of the Western person. Um, so when I did come back, I was still not thinking like they were back in over in Africa. So I was still a little bit greedy for things and wanted more and this and that. But as I grew older, those memories stayed with me of what those people had and, I, and my vision started to open up a bit more. And um, I think as I get older, I've become like, more wise and I've been able to like really learn from those experiences where I, that I had back then mm -hmm. whereas before I kind of just lived those experiences and like didn't think much of them but now when I look back at them and I realize and I'm able to like understand what they were that you can start to implement some yeah. of the lessons I think it takes a bit of maturity to really understand uh, sure. and, and then allow for those lessons that might not have been recognized when you're when I'm younger, younger yeah. to really be implemented now yeah. your dad seems like he was a pretty um, amazing guy because he was he was a refugee is that correct yeah and then he went back to South Sudan to build some churches and schools and things like that yeah what was the role of your dad in your childhood um he was pretty present um throughout my childhood until 2008 which is when he moved back he worked at the university so I used to spend quite a bit of time with there and he studied um he taught uh, aboriginal studies actually at Adelaide University yeah. so I always had a pretty diverse cultural background, which was interesting. But yeah, he he was there to take me to sport and stuff like that and was very present in my life until 2008 when we went back to South Sudan. And the decision was made like as a family. So we sold our house, packed everything up and we all moved back to South Sudan because he had a dream of um, giving back to his village and um, helping the people back up over there. So he wanted to build a school, a hospital, and a nursery school, which he did. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we got to see, while we were over there, the start of all of that stuff. And then um, while I was over there, it just became a bit a bit too much for mum. You know, dad was always out running around doing stuff, and he speaks the language. Mum doesn't speak the language. And not many people over there spoke English, especially the older, the older women around mum's age. None of them spoke English, so she was kind of isolated. And me and my little brother would be running around with all the kids during the day. So she was felt a lot by herself. And then the schooling wasn't the best. So that's the reason why we ended up coming back. And dad made the decision to stay there. And they ended up getting a divorce. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what his, his plan was, to go back there and get back to his people. And that's what he's done. And he's been there ever since. I could imagine it would have been quite difficult for your mum. Because like you were saying, she's English. Yeah. And... You know, she's quite different from, you know, mm. she's, she's a white person going mm. to a country like South Sudan where I'm sure they might not have seen many people yeah. that were similar to your mum. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not even just white people, me, myself as well. Like all the kids would just stare at us when we went to the city mm. and stuff because they'd seen white people before, I think, a few of them, uh, but they hadn't really seen like mixed kids, like half white, half black, which was very strange to them. So like 
I can just remember like walking around at gatherings and stuff where there'd be lots of kids and they'd all just be staring at me and like even sometimes just like poking and like pinching at me and wow. stuff like that. Yeah. So it was like, it was strange at the start, but after I was there for a few months, they kind of, all the kids started to like see me and stuff like that. So then kind of stopped. But when you went over there, did you feel like you were different or oh, prior to going, did you realize that there was differences between you and people from that country um, or did that really shine a light on the differences uh, I think at the start yeah because I was a bit scared as well I was in a, a foreign place um, so people were looking at me people were pointing poking and you know you feel like you got all the eyes on you and then after a while kind of just got and felt better in my own skin and you know kids didn't look at me as much and I kind of just blended in with everyone else so yeah I think at the start it was a bit nerve-wracking and then at the end I, I felt like I was one of them I know you were saying how half your family was black and half your family was white. When you went to South Sudan and after you spent, you know, a, a few months there, did you feel at home? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I felt at home for sure. Um, Dad built a house there, so we, I had my own home as well. Um, those first six, five, six months we spent in a mud hut and then the last three were in like a brick house that he built. So yeah, I felt like I had a home and uh, I do have a lot of family there as well. So I had aunties and uncles and stuff like that that I'd never met. So I, after all, spending six months with them, yeah, I felt like I was at home. I had a similar experience when I went to Syria. I spent a, a couple of months there and it was just a holiday. We never moved over there when I was about 10 or 11. But obviously growing up here, you know, I'm Middle Eastern, so I don't necessarily look like your standard Australian I guess you could say mm -hmm. whatever that may be mm -hmm. because I think Australia is pretty multicultural yeah but although I had never been to Syria before my family's from there when I got there I felt quite at home it was very it was a very uh, foreign feeling because you know everyone spoke the same language I looked like everyone else I wouldn't say we thought the same but I think being able to communicate in the same language and you know have that same cultural um, values and things like that makes you feel quite at home mm. so I could imagine it would have been Pretty interesting going back to the South Sudan and then coming back to Australia. Yeah. How did you find that transition? Because it's quite unsettling. Yeah. Selling everything then nine, ten months later coming back. Yeah, yeah. It was um it was a bit weird when we came back. When I was here, Australia felt like home. And then I went over there, then there felt like home, South Sudan. And then when I came back to Australia, it felt like South Sudan was home. Um so it was a bit strange. And then when we did come back, we didn't have our home because we'd sold our home. So the first year or so back in Australia was real different. Um, I was living with my grandparents for a while on my mother's side, who were white. And then after that, we moved around a little bit. We went and lived with my auntie, who's black. And then after that, we went and ended up living in Henley Beach with one of my mom's friends. So we were jumping around a bit. When we moved over there, we, we sold everything. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was young, so I didn't really know what was going on. But Obviously, parents divorce, there's money and all of this and all that that gets involved. And majority of the stuff went to my father, which was a decision that was made by my mother because she was she wanted him to continue chasing his dreams. So we were kind of left here a little bit stranded, really, for those first couple of months. So it did feel like South Sudan was home. You know, I'd go to school and I wasn't really coming back to my own home. So, yeah, it was a bit different when I came back. How did it make you feel the divorce, especially at you would have been nine yeah. around nine years old that's a pretty pivotal time you know formative years of someone's childhood and I've my parents just recently split up maybe two or three years ago so you know I was lucky enough that I was a bit older so mm. you know those feelings and those emotions that you might feel when you're younger is a bit different when you're older and you can uh, I guess think through things and reason yeah. and you're, you're thinking a bit more logically but at that age at nine you're you know obviously you're young you don't mm. know what's going on how was that yeah it was um I didn't really understand what was going on. I think I was kind of just in my own world. And, uh, you know, when we were, I remember, there's one scene that I remember being at the airport um, when we were leaving and dad wasn't coming with us. And I was really confused why he wasn't coming with us. And I didn't really know what divorce was or anything like that. And I think my parents still didn't know what was going on at that time as well. They weren't sure what was going to happen, but we ended up coming back to Australia and then over the next few years, I knew dad was living there and we were living here, but I wasn't really sure what was going on. And then um, he ended up, he came, he used to come over like once a year as well. Um, so I think the first time he came over, he stayed with us. And then the second time he stayed with us, but he was like in a different part of the house. Like he wasn't mm. staying with mum. It was a bit strange for me. Um, I didn't really understand what was going on. 
But as I got o- older, I kind of understood that mum was getting a divorce. And then I started hearing things like, oh, we need to send these papers to dad to sign and stuff yeah. like that. And then that's when I started to figure out, oh, we're actually divorced here. Yeah. Started to uh, settle in that what was happening. Yeah. Was your father quite... It well, seems like from what you were saying, he was quite uh, present mm. the first few years and then you go to Sudan, South Sudan, and then all of a sudden he's he's not there as much. How did that make you feel? I think didn't really know what was going on. So I was just kind of going with the flow, really. It wasn't too hard on me, really. I think I had a lot of things going on in my life, sports, school and stuff like that. When you're a kid, there's a lot of things and you don't really worry too much about those bigger things, really. You're just worried about like oh, my friend said to this to me at school and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So I um, was just like way out of it and not sure what was going on. Yeah, I, I grew a lot closer with my mum. I'd say before we went to Sudan, I was probably um, a daddy's boy. And then when I came back, I was a mummy's boy. So yeah, it was it was an interesting time. And what's your relationship with your dad now? It's still good, it's still good. Um, I talk to him once a week, usually on the phone. My parents have a, a big age gap. So he's quite old now, he's about 82 so he's old so like using a phone and stuff like that is like a bit of a struggle for him and considering he left in 2008 iPhones and stuff weren't around back then yeah modern technology and stuff like that's a bit hard for him to use and then like you got the time difference as well when you're when you're on the phone there's like a big delay like I'll say one word and then he doesn't talk for like another 30 seconds so like it's crazy it's it's a bit hard to um, keep in contact with him it's all right my relationship with him is good he's been back Every two years, I'd say, since since 2008, really, he comes back here and there. But yeah, I haven't seen him for a while since COVID. Yeah. And my parents still have a very good relationship, mum and dad. Um, they speak on the phone every now and then. Obviously, divorces can be a very tricky thing and they can definitely um, cause a lot of issues within the family. And if, especially if it's a, not a very amicable divorce, it can, be, it can be a problem. I know you've got a younger brother as well who's a professional footballer mm-hmm. because he's your only sibling, is that correct? Only sibling from the same mum. From the same mum? Yeah. yeah, so there's three before me from a different mum and there's two after from a different mum as well. How's that dynamic? It's strange. The older three um, babysit me quite a bit when I was growing up, but then I didn't really spend too much time with them, I'd say, after that 2008 mm-hmm. period. And then the younger two, I've never met them. Been in South Sudan ever since, so I've never met them. Yeah, I've got a pretty good relationship normal relationship we're not as close as i am with my younger brother Teddy. yeah i've got a decent relationship with him did you notice a, a difference in how those years after the south sudan and, and the divorce had an impact on you compared to him i think he was probably more unaware of everything mm-hmm. um than i was because he was even younger mm-hmm. you know i was starting to listen to like conversations of parents you know dinners and stuff like that and just starting to figure out what was going on whereas he was probably a bit more clueless than i was i think he, he dealt with it pretty well I think it was a bit harder on me, probably, I'd say, than it was on him. I I speak from my experience because, obviously, uh, my parents didn't have the greatest of relationship. And um, I I noticed how some of those things, you know, that's your point of reference, your parents as a a couple. So that's your point of reference when you get into a relationship. And I noticed how some of those things um, and the examples I had impacted my future relationships with my partners or partner now when I have multiple. (laughs) Did you notice anything in terms of the impact that that divorce had on your relationships with other people or with a romantic relationship the dynamic between my my mum and and my dad in my eyes was always like very good whereas if sometimes when I speak to my mum about things like that she doesn't remember it being so good like I remember my life before my father went to South Sudan as like a fairy tale and she doesn't remember it as bright as I do my my mum and father always had in my eyes from what I remember it was like a really good relationship you know my dad was present in my life and my father coming from a South Sudanese um background it was more of a he was the more dominant one like he made the decisions in the relationship and stuff like that in regards to you know us or like my mum would obviously have a say but you know like yeah in yeah. those um not so western cultural backgrounds the father's normally the one who's in yeah. charge so yeah that's 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 what I remember of and I think that's probably going to rub on me a little bit as I get older and and start bringing up a family and stuff like that. I don't think it's had too much of an influence on me so far. That's good. I'm not sure if you mentioned the fact that you've got a stepfather. Is that right? Yeah, I did. I had a stepfather, yeah. You had a stepfather. Yeah. How was that a new person, a new man being introduced into the the family dynamic? That was probably one that changed my life a little bit in in a few different ways. One is it was quite strange and I was, I think... 
I was very defensive of my mum. I didn't want her to have another partner. I wanted my father to be my father. I didn't want to have a stepfather, I think. But that was like kind of hidden in the back of my mind, really. I wasn't like, oh, I don't want a stepfather, blah, 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 whatever. But subconsciously, I was doing things that, you know, kind of influenced their relationship, I think, because I didn't want to have a stepfather in my life. But um, he was a lovely guy and I grew quite fond of him and we created a pretty good relationship. And he was probably like the biggest influence in, in my footballing career so far because mm. he was Portuguese. Um, and he loved soccer, so he's kind of the reason that I picked up and started playing soccer and fell in love for it, which has been a blessing, yeah. a blessing on my life. Yeah, and, and the start of the relationship was very good. He ended up being my soccer coach at my club, and I loved it. And then slowly towards the end of their relationship, I felt like I was more close with him than my younger brother because um, he was my soccer coach, and we'd go to trainings together and stuff like that. And then it kind of swapped and my brother was like the more favorite if you'd say mm. um he coached my brother instead they'd go to training and stuff and i kind of distanced as i got older i kind of found myself dis- distancing from him a bit um and then they ended up breaking up i still keep in contact with him he still was watching over my soccer career and stuff and we talk about he's a big benfica fan so we talk about mm. football and stuff like that here and there you were saying how you distanced yourself once he started coaching tete was that because you feel like he was giving more attention to your brother I don't. I actually don't know, man. Like, it was just weird how, for some reason, we just started getting a bit further and further apart. Because you would have been a teen, like teenager, yeah, then, yeah. Yeah, it was. I think it was just me becoming a teenager and going through whatever I was going through in school and stuff like that. I kind of found myself dis- distancing from him, and my, my brother did the opposite and started getting a bit closer to him. Yeah, it was, it was a strange scenario for me to be in. Yeah, me and my brother didn't like get further away as he got closer to him or anything like that yeah i don't know it's it's something that you know i still question myself on today is like how did we start slowly drifting away from each other have you ever asked him uh no we haven't spoken about it he, he's now moved to new south wales actually as well oh, wow. so he's a bit further away yeah these things happen especially in the teenager years it's a very it's awkward yeah you, know, you got friends and then you got girls coming in or whoever you're interested in it's just a it's not unusual to you know have a bit of distance between your parents because mm. you, yeah you know, you're going through all those hormones yeah yeah obviously we'll get to that incident of racism against Melbourne Victory mm. but did you find growing up that you were subjected to any racism I think I didn't have any scenarios where there was like blatant racism <laughs> my schooling was very interesting primary school I went to like a school in the city Gilly Street Primary which was like very multicultural. Um, so there was like a program for refugees there as well or kids that didn't speak English English as a second language so it was very multicultural school although I spoke English as my first language um, it was very multicultural school I grew up with like kids from different backgrounds all around me when I went overseas and then came back and I ended up moving to the west side of Adelaide and uh, I was living in Henley Beach I ended up going to Henley High which was like very polar opposite like the whole school was Aussies kids that loved surfing kicking footies and stuff like that so like i was like an outcast i think when i went to this was in year eight my first day of school there was only like three other black kids in the school Mm. and one of them was in my year level and the other one was like some older kid that i didn't know so i was like from the get-go i was like different to everyone else Mm. you know i don't remember having many like blatant incidents where someone was like very racist to me like i feel like people are a bit scared it was a bit that's very confrontational like there's repercussions when that happens like you don't know how that person's gonna interact with you after they do something whereas like if you do something online or something like that it's a bit different no accountability yeah if you do it online how did you find in those teenagers year, teenager years like we were talking about it's quite an odd odd time you're trying to figure out who you are you add that layer of being different to everyone else i felt quite similar the private school i went to i wouldn't say it's multicultural we had a few other ethnicities like Greeks um, and Italians, mm. but it was mainly Australians and there was no other, really, there was no other Arab kids. Mm-hmm. The only other Arab kids were my cousins. Mm-hmm. From, like you said, the get-go, I felt a bit different and, you know, you bring different food. It's the small things, like you bring different food, yeah. you speak a different language, you have, you know, different values and, and different things like that. So those differences, when you're quite um, isolated, I feel as though they're amplified. How did you feel in terms of growing up and accepting those differences because initially I had difficulties doing that I wanted to be like you know everyone else but as I grew up older I started to embrace my differences did you experience that same journey or were you pretty keen to take on those differences straight away I had my journey as well 
I can remember, I don't know if it was more because I wanted to be like a white person or not, but I can remember straightening my hair and stuff like that when I was a bit younger. There was a lot of my people I looked up to in life or people that I've seen on TV and stuff like that all had straight hair and stuff like that. I had curly hair, obviously, which is a big difference. And um, I can remember straightening my hair when I was younger and maybe distancing myself. I was quite distanced when I came back from South Sudan from my black family because I was living with my mum I didn't see them as much so that was another strange thing is like I felt black and then at home mum was white so she didn't really although she like embraced those uh, cultural mm. things that father taught her I was in like three different worlds kind of I was at home with mum she was white and then I felt black and then at school everyone was white again so like it was strange I think as I got older I definitely grew into that being who I am more um I, I had more more role models like I just had there was more people that I was able to see like black men that stood out to me and were doing great things in the world and then that made me more proud of who I was and wanted to be like them who are some of those role models I'm not sure why but when I was younger I just remember everyone just being white not that I looked up to but everywhere you looked where you saw someone doing something good they were usually a white person but I just feel like over the, the last five ten years there's been a lot more black men doing like great things in the world and stuff like that i remember obama was a big influence um not necessarily on me but i remember the kids in south sudan all had like these little obama posters and stuff like that and they always used to yell his name and stuff like that so people like that adam goods also mm. yeah i watched his uh, documentary with my mom and seeing you know indigenous players come in the footy and do well and stuff like that that really had an influence on me as well you make a very good point about I felt the same growing up. All the people that I had looked up to were coincidentally white. And I think mm. that's as a result of the power dynamics that I play. And you came into the league with a bit of swagger. Um, you were expressing yourself. At times, you've been villainized for being who you are. I feel like in Australian football culture and stuff like that, there's not much flair, not much swagger. And like they want everyone to just stay in their lane and, and do as they're told kind of thing. When you came into the league and you started being yourself... How was the reception did you find? Because like you said, it seems like these days everyone's just a robot. There's no personality in anything anymore when it comes to interviews or appearances or even the style of football in Australia. No one has the, I guess, the balls to be themselves and, and play themselves. How did you find that reception? I think it was interesting. When I came uh, into the league as a professional footballer, I had a very strict coach and um I struggled with a lot of injuries and I was young and uh, I was kind of a bit scared as well. I didn't make my debut until later on in that year and I think that whole first year was a bit like nerve-wracking, you know, first year being with the first team. Mm. Um, there was a lot of older boys in the squad and stuff like that and it was a lot more, you know, the young boys have to stay in their place, like fill the water bottle, do this, do that, blah, 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 blah. And um, these last couple of years have been a lot better with, um, especially I feel like Carl has brought like a pretty good um, environment into the changing room and having Stefan Mork as a, as a captain the last couple of years as a young captain as well was like I think it was great for for our team and and for everyone because I felt like I could you know be a bit more of myself I didn't feel like I had someone like a like an old person just like looking down on me mm -hmm. like making sure you do your thing he was like more accepting of everyone and letting everyone be who they were but you know making sure that they they weren't mucking around and stuff like that but you, you could be who you want those little things like that, having Stefan as a captain, bringing Carl in, playing more games, just after I scored my first goal, goal I felt so much more relieved, had mm. that pressure off my back and stuff, and I was able to just open up and, and be who I wanted to be. Having an environment that allows you to be who you are is so important because getting into that comfort area allows you to play to your best ability. If you're always worried about if I fuck up this pass, are they going to lose it at me or yeah. I can't be myself? Then you're not really being authentic. And if you're not being authentic, how are you really meant to really enjoy your football and play your football? Mm. Talking about that first that first goal that you scored against Melbourne Victory, cracky game, by the mm. way, can I just say, and great performance. I know it's been a few years, but yeah. <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. You come on, you assist and you score. Mm -hmm. After that, you did a celebration. And then tell me what happened after that. Uh, everything like leading up to, th to that game was like a bit weird as well that whole start of the season was a bit weird um, there was a not many people know but there was like an incident that happened in pre-season with uh, where I got involved with a bit of an argument with Carl with the coach at halftime of one of the pre-season games and I kind of got punished after that um, I got sent to like the youth team so I was away from the first team squad 
after that whole little scenario because I was starting in preseason and playing really well. And then Tommy Urich came in as well and I wasn't getting selected for the squad. I wasn't traveling to away games. I felt quite alienated and stuff like that. And I ended up being chucked into a random game against Brisbane Raw away, which is where I made my starting debut. But it just happened to be like there was no one else to play really. So I ended up playing and I did a, I did all right. Um, and then I didn't play for a long period of time after that. And then I randomly got chucked in again to a random game against Western Sydney because Tommy Rich got injured again and there was no one else. And then the following week we played at home and I didn't play for 90 minutes. I sat on the bench and that following week was that was that Melbourne victory game. So there was like a lot that like build up, built up into that game. And the year before that as well, I was on the bench. I actually played for Adelaide against against victory in that same stadium at Marvel. And Naboo scored like a last minute goal mm-hmm. against us and like did a knee slide right in front of our bench. And I remember, you know, Dimi Panna. <laughs> yeah. That year though, last the year before that, he messaged me and was like, oh, Cass, if you score against victory today, man, make sure you do some wild celebration or something and I was like yeah of course and then I sat on the bench and then Naboo scored and did that knee slide right in front of the bench so I I was rem- that was in the back of my head as well leading up to that game and I just remember that game like they just chucked me in I think it was what was it it was 1-1 I think when I came on yeah it was yeah, 1-1 yeah. when I came on yeah I knew I knew that the defender they had a young defender playing as well I was real excited for that game it was Marvel Stadium like a big stadium and victory weren't doing well that season at all they weren't doing very well, but they were getting a decent result against us. And um, Ross Aloisi, he's, uh, who was our assistant coach, gets real fired up in those victory games, you know, gets the boys buzzing and stuff like that. And um, he doesn't really like the Victorians at all. So, um, yeah, he was telling me, like, come on, make sure you come on. We need to win this, like, screw these guys, blah, 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 whatever. So then I come on and had a chance at the very start where I was one. We were on defend, did a little move, hit the post. And I was like, oh, that was so easy. Like, I hit the post. I could have scored easy yeah. there. I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to score. So then um, I'd seen that ball come across from Javi played it in behind for Goody and there was like a man with me and I like shielded him off, tapped it in and the first, like, I didn't even think, like just tapped it in and I knew I was, I, I wasn't planned, the celebration or anything wasn't planned, like I knew I was going to do something but I didn't know what I was going to do. The adrenaline just got to me, I just jumped over that board and I just saw like all those guys just standing there, the victory guards and I just started like looking at them, I put my chest out, like I actually had no idea what I was doing. And then um, Great yeah. images by the way You see the guy in the back putting Yeah with the finger. root finger And stuff so like The pics were wild as well <laughs> And then after that the, I got an assist as well For mm. Stefan's goal And like I just remember like Yelling and stuff And like After I did the celebration though In the stadium Every single time I touched the ball I was getting booed mm. So like it was It was my first experience Of being booed like that as well Did that spur you on a bit? Yeah for sure yeah. When I was hearing like The black I just go to do like a one, two, like just do like tap the ball or anything. And they're like, boo. I and I was like, oh, oh, like, this is real. Like they're really getting onto me and stuff. And then I gave that assist. And I remember just like screaming at the fans and stuff. And it was wild. Um, but nothing actually like in terms of the, the racial situation, I think I don't, I didn't hear. It's like loud in the stadium as well. Of course. So I, I don't remember hearing anything or anything like that in the stadium. Um, and then after the game, I had an interview with like Fox Sports or whatever and then we went into the change rooms and my phone was like we were singing our song my phone was just blowing up like I was just like trying to record us celebrating or something and I was just getting message after message after message like it was just popping up on my phone and that that's where the messages started Mm -hmm. like I was recording like us singing songs and stuff and I was seeing people like putting monkey emojis and stuff on my on my things and stuff like that and like I was like, whoa, what's going on? Like, people were just, like, abusing me. It wasn't all racial abuse, but there was, like, a lot of other heavy abuse that wasn't racially motivated and stuff like that. And I, I just left my phone. Like, I, I, I think I saw, like, one couple messages and stuff like that. And then when I got back to we were eating dinner at the hotel, my brother sent me a message or something. Our social media manager came up to him and was like, oh, Cass, I'm not sure if you've seen, but... Yeah, there's a lot of racial stuff been going on on your social medias and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't really know too much about it. I just saw my brother send me a message, blah, blah, whatever. And yeah, full on after that. It's quite sad, actually, because I remember I was watching the game with a friend of mine when you had scored and you did that celebration. I turned to him. And this is how sad the state of affairs is. is Mm. I turned to him. I said, he's going to cop a lot of racial abuse after this. Straight away, I knew it. People are like that, unfortunately. Yeah. After that, obviously... You've said in interviews before that kind of spoilt your, you know, first goal and, and you know, your breakout performance, which mm. is really unfortunate. But you also thrust into, a, I guess, an ambassador role for 
you know, racism in trying to stamp it out of football. I know you mentioned Adam Good's documentary. Mm. And I know you said previously that you weren't looking to say anything about it, but your mum convinced you to, to say something in response to that documentary that Adam Good's released. Mm. My question is, as that role of being an ambassador against racism was thrust onto you mm. and you took that responsibility, was that something that you were able to deal with, that additional role? Because obviously as a young footballer, you're just trying to break into the first team and get consistent you know, minutes and you just want to put your head down and work. But all of a sudden there's all this media around you and it can be quite, I can imagine, relentless. How did you find that role? I think I probably wasn't, yeah, it wasn't something that like I went and seeked out. It just happened to like fall upon me. Um, but I think I was, I was kind of ready. My, my father probably had a big influence on, on me as like, he was one of the first South Sudanese people in South Australia. So he was like a real big leader for the community and everyone like that. So I remember he, seeing him when I was younger, you know, lecturing the young kids and stuff like that on not just racial things and stuff like that, but trying to teach them how to stay out of trouble and making sure they're switched on and try to do something with their life and stuff like that. So I, he, that's the type of role model my father was. Mm. And I guess that's the type of person that I want to be when I get older and for my kids and stuff like that. I'm always trying to help my friends better themselves and stuff like that. So as soon as they came to me and were like, oh, do you want to speak up about this? And, you know, I was like, yeah, for sure. I want to speak up about this. I want to, I want to help other people who might find themselves in this situation and show people that, uh, you know, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't affected me too much. And, you know, I'm able to, even though it's hap- all this stuff is happening to me, I'm going to be able to come out of it on the other side better than I was before. So, yeah, I was, I was, I was happy to, to take on that role. I think you handled it very well, you know, all, all the things that you said how disappointing it is and I know you mentioned in regards to stopping it in the future people should have checks they should be checked when they start a social media account it allows for a bit of accountability so you know identification yeah. so at least for allows for a bit of accountability what's mm. frustrating I could imagine though is you know you hear what you say and you see Marcus Rashford has done a lot of work against racism overseas but it still remains an issue and, and it seems like from what I've read you've been still receiving some racial yeah, some yeah, racial abuse yeah. since that game. Yeah, after that game, it like, hasn't been the same. Like, anything I did, like, after every game, I'd have a couple messages from, like, some randoms just on social media and stuff, or people would still comment. thing was me, like, I don't really look at my, my DM requests and stuff like that. That was kind of because of all of that stuff mm-hmm. that happened. So, like, after that game, the reason I said it, like, kind of spoiled the moment and stuff like that. I had a lot of family and stuff that were, like, reaching out to me and stuff like that, sending me messages, and it was all coming into my message requests and stuff like that. So I couldn't, I didn't want to look in any of those messages because I was seeing all these other messages, so I didn't really want to go in there. So I stopped kind of looking in there, and then, but my comments is like, mm. anyone can just go in the comments and like, type, you can you can turn that off in settings, but like, if I turn off my comments, then my friends and my family who want to comment on my photos can't comment on my photos. So like, yeah, it was, um, it was disappointing. But yeah, after that game, every, every, every away game pretty much, um, I've been booed and then I'll after every game if I score especially I'll or I do a celebration because I scored a few goals after mm-hmm. that did a few celebrations as well more messages it is, is it? disappointing but like it, it they haven't affected me too much obviously it's not nice I don't want to be looking at my phone and seeing these messages and stuff but I've always said like for me when someone's on the other side of a screen like typing a message like it doesn't really get to me too much because you know I don't know who you are and they don't know who I am and they're just blurting some messages with their fingers if people were like coming up to my face and saying that that would be a lot more hurtful for me i reckon and um it'd probably get to me more but um yeah the ones over social media don't they're disappointing you don't want to see it and it's not good but um you know it hasn't affected me too much yeah that's good to hear it hasn't drained you because i could imagine it it would drain a lot of people Mm. you know that constant barrage of abuse for doing you didn't do anything wrong yeah you celebrated Mm. Have you noticed that since that incident and since, I guess, the ambassador role that you've had to take, not only as a result of an ambassador against racism, but it seems like your heritage was brought up into light, the South Sudan heritage of yours. And I I, I could imagine you'd be considered a role model for the South Sudanese community now. Mm. Is that something you feel as well? It's not just the role as uh, an ambassador against racism, but also for younger, not just South Sudanese players, uh, kids, but uh, African kids. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've got tons of kids that are coming up to me after games and stuff like that, and like, oh, Yangi, Yangi, I want to be like you when I'm old, blah, blah, blah. And that, that's really motivating, and I'm, I'm happy that they look up to me, and hopefully, you know, I want to show that I'm a, a strong role model for them on the pitch, off the pitch. Do you feel that pressure 
because obviously again you're you know you're 22 23 we all we make mistakes when younger but those mistakes are amplified and scrutinized in your position not just as a professional footballer but as a role model for the kids do you ever feel that yeah i i, I do i do i feel it all the time i reckon um but it's not something that i kind of shy away from you know i'm i'm happy i have that that pressure on me and i think it makes me me better you know I, i'm always looking at what i'm doing um how i'm acting on the field how i'm acting like off the field where someone might see or i might because i could influence kids you know easily so I, everything that, that I do, I, I kind of look at what I'm posting on social media because um, I know there's kids looking at me and want to be like me. So I, I'm looking at all those types of things. Yeah, I always feel that that presence, like I've got to make sure that I'm being a good role model for other people. And I, I enjoy that. I enjoy that. Yeah. yeah. And I know South Sudan has approached you as well to play for, yeah. for their country, but it seems like you're waiting for potentially representing the Socceroos, that divided legion of where you feel you, you come from. So you know, throughout your younger years, like you were saying, you spent some time in South Sudan, more time in Australia. Where do you feel you truly belong? Yeah, I, I'd say I don't really know yet. It's like ongoing learning and stuff like that. In terms of like representing a national team, it's a very interesting scenario. Where it's like I don't fully feel South Sudanese. I don't fully feel Australian. I don't fully feel English. I feel like I'm just a mix of all of them and there's not a national team that I can represent that's like a mix of all of those. Yeah, so it's interesting. I think in terms of my, my personal life, I feel like I um, fit in more with my um, my father's family. I'd say that. Um, I think when I was younger, I spent more time with them um, and I just feel more connected to them with their cultural values and stuff like that than I do with my mother's family. Um, although I'm quite close to my mother's family. When you, when it comes to football, there's so many other things that, that become involved, you know. Yeah. It's not just about where you feel, who you feel like you're from. Because South Sudan, like I'd love to play for South Sudan, but, you know, South Sudan don't have the same amount of resources and stuff like that to be able to play football and to compete for championships and stuff like that. So it gets all real confusing and stuff like that when it comes to football terms, I guess. How was it then if you feel you identify more with your father's um, side of the family and then growing up, in your mother's household did you feel conflicted yeah yeah for sure I, I feel conflicted kind of everywhere I am when I'm with my mum's family I almost feel like I don't belong there but then when I'm with my father's family I still don't feel like I belong there but sometimes I feel like I belong in one place a little bit more than I do in the other which is interesting for me and, and you know I feel like it changes all the time it depends like what we're doing or like what's going on and stuff like that, what type of event it is as well. Yeah. Like sometimes I feel like, oh, I don't really feel like I belong here at this type of event with these people. But then another time I might feel like, oh, yeah, I do feel like I belong here with these people. Um, so it's strange. Like I said, it's always changing for me. I feel like I never feel like I'm in the right place. I feel like sometimes I feel like I should be here. Sometimes I feel like I should be there. And I think, though, that's something that's like becoming quite common in Australia. Like we've got a lot of different diverse cultures and stuff and even with un we're amongst like a lot of the other African boys in the league, I think that's how a lot of the other them feel as well. Mm. Um, I feel like Australia is kind of like it's growing into a bit more of like a melting pot of different cultures and stuff like that. Because I couldn't tell you like this person is Australian. I feel like there's so many different cultures and so many mm. different things that are coming together in Australia, and and that's what's making people Australian. Like if you look at the national team, Awa Mabil's there. He could have easily played for South Sudan or whatever, but. I feel like he probably feels the same way as well. What you mentioned in regards to the African players, it seems like there's been a big, in the recent few years, influx of African players. And I think that's probably as a result of that mass migration, like the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. They've started to grow up and play grassroots football. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine how great that would be for younger kids to see representation at that level. Mm -hmm. The issue with, I think, football in Australia is some of the costs that mm -hmm. go into playing football. Yeah. And so I know in terms of my nationality, um, like Iraq and Syria, and a lot of those migrants, when they come over, they don't really have the, I guess, income mm -hmm. or, or the ability to pay for some of those f uh, fees for yeah. junior football. Yeah. And that's a massive barrier because there would be a lot of kids out there that can play and would be able to play at a really high level, but because their parents can't afford it, they don't get the opportunity. Is that something that you've noticed in the African community? Um, yeah, for sure. I've noticed that. I think for me, it wasn't too bad. My father came over here with nothing really and he built a 
pretty big legacy and empire for himself over here i'd say you know he he was quite wealthy when he left um obviously he went over there to build schools and stuff so he had some money to you know do those things and my mother worked as well so when i was younger i was quite a wealthy kid i'd say you know i came from a background where my father came from like a poor country my mother was quite wealthy but when people looked at me in the street and stuff like that they'd probably think oh this kid's poor whatever blah blah blah. but I was quite wealthy but then that kind of changed when my father took all the money and went over to South Sudan you know my mom was here as a single parent with two kids so it was a bit tough for her Um, but we always kind of found ways to be able to pay for school fees and soccer fees and stuff like that and I was lucky enough that I think in Australia like when you're when you're like at a decent level usually you get you get away with it like clubs mm-hmm. will help you out pay for this if you're good you know like if, if they're going to get something out of it then they'll try help you as much as you can whereas for kids that maybe aren't as good but have potential to be good or like just love the sport in general that's they're the ones that you know struggle a bit because if they can't pay for it and they're they're not the best player in the team then the club isn't really going to want to help them pay for anything you know what I mean yeah, which yeah. which is quite disappointing because I think there should be equal opportunity for people that do want to play the game. Yeah, talking about you now, obviously you've had your fair share of injuries. Mm. How frustrated must you feel when you had that those run of games after the Melbourne victory game, um, where you're playing well, you're scoring, you're getting minutes, and then injuries hit, and then injuries hit again. How frustrating must you feel? Yeah, it was. It's, it's been wouldn't say the story of, but um, yeah, I've had my fair few share of injuries so far in my career last year especially was um like real disappointing for me because I was on like a real hot run you know and it wasn't just me the team was doing well we were on like some I think it was like eight or seven game unbeaten streak like it was we were about to break club records and stuff like that and I got injured before a game and and then I thought I was going to come back and then got injured again in training just before I was going to come back and then ended up getting back on the pitch played a few games and then bang injured again so yeah it was very disappointing and we had a team that I thought we could have done really well last year if we had a world players available and stuff like that. So, yeah, in- injuries suck. But um, I feel like, you know, you can either go two ways about it. Like, you can just put your head down and think, oh, why does this keep happening to me, blah, blah, blah. Or you can, like, work harder and look to improve on everything that you haven't been doing maybe as well and try to eliminate injuries in the future, which is what I've, what I've tried to do every time I get injured. Did you feel throughout those series of injuries and currently that your mental health as a result of those injuries started to deteriorate at all? I pride myself on being very mentally strong. Um, I think some of the experiences that I've had growing up and um, who my parents are and their influence on me and um, having that open mind of seeing how good my life is here in Australia, regardless if I'm injured or not, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like I've got wealth, I've got food, I've got water and stuff like that. And, being able to go to South Sudan and see kids that don't have as much has really opened up my eyes so much, especially as I've got older. So, no, I think my mental health at the start of injuries and stuff like that can be a bit daunting. You're like, oh, again, blah, 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 whatever. But I feel like I'm pretty strong and I I get up and get stuck in my rehab pretty early days. And, yeah, the injuries haven't really affected my mental health too much. That's really good to hear because it can be easy to fall into those, like you said, pitfalls of, feeling as though you're a victim to the circumstances and it's a, it perpetuates the cycle and mm-hmm. it, it can be hard to get yourself out of that mm-hmm. type of thought process. You went from the highs of scoring against Melbourne Victory, our biggest rivals, having that good run of games, and then you go to the lows of injuries. With those highs, you get, those incre- you get that increased media attention mm-hmm. and now on the sidelines, it's a bit quieter. Mm-hmm. How did you feel that process was from everyone wanting to speak to you and then I wouldn't say you're forgotten about, but yeah. people don't pay much attention to you. You're not yeah. playing, things like that. Yeah. It's the highs and the lows. How do you feel about that? You feel it. You feel it. Maybe you don't feel it. You notice it for sure because like after that victory goal last season and everything was going on, even the start of this season, like I scored in round one against Sturridge, you know, leading up to the start of the A-League, there was all this like social media posts about Yangi versus Sturridge and this and that, this and that, you know, I was getting called for interviews like every day from random radio stations and stuff like that I want to know about the season and stuff like that the club gave me number nine so I was like the number nine of the club yeah um, starting striker blah, blah blah so like yeah my preseason was quite busy in terms of like social media and all of that influence and stuff like that as soon as I got injured boom it's like nothing like you know, no one's calling to talk to you no interviews and stuff like that actually I did do one interview the other day with 
Channel 10 and the guy was like, oh yeah, you've been injured for a long time. Like everyone's kind of forgotten about you. So we just wanted to like, you know, see how your injury's going. Stuff like that. So that was, that was nice. Um, but yeah, you just got to be really mentally strong. I think um, as long as you've got like good people around you, you know, you just focus on what you need to do to get back on the pitch and get back to that. Depends where you want to be. Mm. Um, like I, I love being at that high point, you know, I think everyone would, you know, when everybody wants to talk to you and everybody wants to watch you play and stuff like that. I loved being at that high point. Um, and that's where I want to get back to. So, you know, I kind of just put my head down and work hard to get back to get back to that. As long as you've got like um, good support around you. I think my my mum's very good for that. Um, and I've got my brother, even though he lives overseas, we have a really good relationship. And I've got a good group of friends who, um, you know, keep me grounded and keep me working hard. Yeah, in terms of the mental side and all of that, it, it can be tough. Mm-hmm. But I think for me, I, I, I feel like I'm different. Mm. And I feel like I, I deal with that really well. I could yeah. imagine it would be difficult, you know, going from that high mm. and then going to that low, give you a different appreciation of, of those high moments. For sure. And I also, I guess it would really, it would make any media scrutiny that you get a bit easier to deal with because, you know, at the end of the day, this cycle will run out and they'll, you know, they'll be the next big thing or they'll pick on the next person and yeah. it just comes in waves and things like that. Yeah, yeah. When I've spoken to people that have had injuries in, in, in elite sports, it seems for those that did struggle with the the mental side of it that they attached a lot of their value to the identity of being a professional athlete. Mm. So their identity is completely combined with their occupation. Yeah, yeah. And so when that's taken from them mm-hmm. as a result of injury, which is something that's not in, in their control a lot of the time, I guess they go through an identity crisis. Yeah, you're you, like nobody. You're nobody. Yeah. Uh, because unfortunately, in the way society works is occupation is is really the thing that people will know you from or know mm. you label you from. Yeah. And so you're Cassini, the football player. So now that you're injured, you're Cassini. Was that something you struggled with to begin with, that, that identity crisis? Or it seems like you, you were able to get through that pretty well? I think I was able to get through it pretty well. Um, the first couple of weeks were pretty daunting for me, um, especially with my most recent injury because it was like a full surgery. I couldn't walk after um, crutches, wheelchair for like the first two weeks. So I was literally at home with my leg up on a couch, couldn't move. Mum would bring me food, so I had her there. Um, and I just played a bit of PlayStation and stuff with my friends and stuff like that. And then after that, I just wanted to get straight back into the work. And I think, yeah, it, it can be like that. I do see other other people who get injured that kind of happen to them, mm-hmm. that identity kind of crisis. Um, being a professional footballer is like when you're on the field, that's just one part of your job. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of other things that go into it, like your training and then how you eat and all of these types of things. So I still feel like when I'm on the field and when I'm off the field, I'm still professional footballer. Not many people are watching what I'm doing, but what I'm doing is still very important for Cassini Yangi, the footballer. So I try to watch what I eat, the way I sleep and stuff like that. And those things help me stay sane, I think. Mm. Keep me on track as well, because I know I'm not on the field, but... I'm a professional footballer and I've got to maintain these things so when I get back on the field, I'll be good to go. Um, I, th- I think it's intertwined quite a lot with purpose. You still yeah. have that purpose, yeah. which drives you to do those things off the field to get you back onto the field. Mm-hmm. And a lot of time with injuries for some people, that purpose is taken from them. So what's the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purpose is a great word to, to use, I think. Goals as well, like having goals. Most definitely. Like I have real big goals um, that I want to achieve and I know that just because I got injured, that isn't going to affect, you know, I still have to do all these other things. And the reason I'm doing it is to get to this place. And even though I'm not on the field, there's all these other things that I can do that are going to help me get to that place, you know? So, um, yeah, purpose, having a purpose and why you're doing it, not just doing it because just because you want a couple fans to like yell your name on the weekend and when you score a goal and stuff like that. Like I want to get to bigger places, get to higher places. And I know that consistency and I have to be consistent with all these things that mm-hmm. I'm doing to get to that place just because I'm off the field doesn't mean that I you know I've been all those things and playing on the field isn't the only thing that's going to help me get to my goals yeah. yeah and I think like you were saying your bigger goals so it seems <coughs> like you're very internally motivated it's mm-hmm. not the extrinsic things yeah you know it's not the fans or things like that it's you want to achieve those goals because you want to not because you want everything that goes with achieving those goals 100% yeah I do a lot of I've done I've done a lot of thinking I'd say a lot of educating myself and reading and uh, listening not so much reading but listening to things I like to listen to like different podcasts and listen to all different people from different aspects of different sports as well influence me as well 
so yeah, I, I, I set my goals and, you know, I try, I want to develop myself, not just as a footballer, but as a person, become mm. the best person I can. So um, a lot of things that I do off the field aren't motivated just as being a footballer. Like I want to be a healthy person, so I eat well, apart from being a footballer. Um, you know, I sleep good on time and stuff like that. Um, do you think that's why with the injuries you found that you've been able to get through it a bit easier because 100%. you're not attaching all your value to the football it's I just want to be a better person 100%. and that the byproduct of being a better person will make you a better footballer 100% 100% Cristiano Ronaldo my idol mm-hmm. everything that I do I, I think about I always question myself all the time like what would he do mm. I had legit have it written up on my wall in my bedroom what what would Cristiano do so everything that I do pretty much I, I think about what he would do um in all parts of my life and you know I've, there's so many different aspects of the game that aren't just when you're on the football pitch like mentality is another thing as well so that's one thing that I've also done like we have an excellent service the PFA I don't know mm. if you know about the PFA Professional Footballers Association yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but um most A-League players are members of them and they have so many good things that they can um you know offer us um, that not many people take up um, So yeah I've been doing some training With like a mental coach as well um, In my time that I've been injured So that's been interesting Something I haven't done before What does that involve? So I do like a Zoom session With a guy And we, we talk about Building routines And stuff like that And you know I'm just in the early stages of it So I'm getting used to it And something I haven't done before But it's You know It's helping me I, I think Having structure in my life Is important as well because you're a very goal, goal oriented person mm. and you have those big goals that you want to achieve. Mm. Do you find yourself falling into the trap of not being content with the journey? For example, a lot of people, they, I'll be happy once I earn this amount of money mm-hmm. or I'll be happy once I own that car. And then they own that car and then it's, okay, I'll be happy once I own this car, or mm. two cars, three cars. It's always more and more and more. And I think sometimes, I guess in this society, we get... Uh, drawn into always being ambitious which is not a bad thing but as an an expense of that ambition is feeling content and I Mm -hmm. feel like sometimes when we feel content people will see that as laziness or being complacent Mm -hmm. and so it's a bit of a paradox do you notice that in the pursuit of your goals you are forgetting to enjoy the journey now because I could imagine when you were younger you were looking up at LA United players saying fuck I want to be an LA United player and now you're an LA United player I'm sure you're looking at you know Premier League players or whatever it is and you're thinking Fuck! I want to get to that plot. That, yeah. To that point, do you notice you, you fall in those traps? Yeah, for sure. I I fall in. I don't know if they're traps, but um, yeah. When I was younger, obviously I wanted to to be better, and I was playing like you know MPL. And I saw A League players, I was like, I want to be A League player. And then now I'm A League player. I want to be, you know, the next mm-hmm. make the next step. Um, I'm always looking to make the next step. I think content is like content is like a lot of players. A lot of players in Australia, especially, are very you know, happy with their lifestyle here and, and happy with who they are and stuff. And I'm always trying to better myself. So that's one thing that I think I have an advantage over everyone. Mm. Yeah, so I'm, I, I, I tick one box and, you know, I'm already looking at the next box. Mm. But I do, um, I think at the start of my career, like you said, the um, not enjoying the moment mm. um, earlier on in the start of my career, that was something probably I didn't enjoy as much, the journey. Mm. Um, I was always looking at, like, the outcome. But it's like... Every now and then, me and a couple of mates will have those moments where we'll sit back and look at like things that happened like a year ago, and we're like, "Wow, like that was a great time." Like, mm. we really need to just enjoy the journey. Like, I can remember waking up on Sunday mornings when I was playing MPL if I didn't play on the Saturday and going to like run in like. Remember Theo Sunis? <laughs> They're going to run in like a treadmill in like an <laughs> altitude room on Sunday mornings, bro. Just like grinding and stuff like that. Going in the gym late nights with Connor, G, Connor yeah, G yeah. and stuff like that. And I just remember like those were great times. And like in the moment, I was probably thinking like, oh, I don't want to do this, man. Like I just want to get to where I want to get to. But like now I look back on it like I'm so happy those moments happened because like I, those are the things that you need to cherish the most. And like uh, Snapchat memories, actually, they, they're one thing that like helps me a lot. Like I'll look in my memories and I'll see something from last year like, wow, that, that was a good time. And like as these moments are happening right now, like today, I'm, I'm trying to cherish these days more and more and more because I know in the future I'm going to miss them. And it's the journey that, you know, you fall in love with. Considering you've realised that quite early in your career, that's a good thing mm. because I think a lot of people they get to the end of their career and they think, wow, I should have just taken a breath and yeah. taken a moment to really uh-huh. take everything in. Because like we were saying, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be an A-League player. And so I could imagine, you know, knowing the person I am and 
what you've said is there's always the thing that you want to achieve next. Mm. Have you um, noticed when when I started football, I was playing because I loved it, I enjoyed it. And then as I grew older, it started to become, I wouldn't say a chore, but mm. it was more serious, of course. You yeah. know, you go to NPL yeah. and whatever it is, you, you make your state teams and you're, you're trying to be a pro footballer. Have you noticed that when you've become a professional footballer, turning your hobby and passion into a job, that the enjoyment of it has declined a bit? You know, when I was a junior, playing like just local, I played at Fulham and then Adelaide Comets for a year. And I used to love, love waking up on Sunday and going to play a match day and like scoring goals and stuff like that, whatever. The older I got in my career, like you said, it got more serious, like going through the state teams and NTC and stuff like that. I remember like going to stick tournament and like stressing like, oh my God, I've got to put in a good performance there, like far out. Like what if I do a bad first touch, blah, 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 whatever. And then, like, you get to where you are now and you look back and you're like, what the hell was I doing? Like, why was I stressing? Like, if I did a bad shot, what? who cares? Whatever, no. like, I think it's not the end of the world and stuff like that. And I think now, as I've got older, I've got to, a, like, a real good headspace and a real clear mind, whereas, like, even in the A-League, man, like, I know there's a lot of players that feel like they have so much pressure on them, mm-hmm. even in my team and stuff like that. And sometimes maybe I get like this and stuff like that. But, like, there's literally no pressure. Like, there's no relegation. Like, if your team loses all the games in the season, like, nothing's bad's going to happen no really if you've got a contract for next year well they're not just going to terminate your contract like there's barely there's not that many viewers it's not like premier league like millions of people are watching and stuff like that if i miss a penalty or something or i miss a shot i'm still going to go home at the end of the mm. day the same i'm gonna have my mum there i'm gonna eat dinner with her and you know i'm still gonna have my life so there's no there's no pressure on you whereas sometimes you know all these little things they build up on you and then you feel like you're cramped in a little box yeah. when there's really no, there's no stress and I think I'm getting as you get older and as you mature and your mind gets stronger you get to a place where you like you're able to see things cl- a lot clearer I'm getting closer and closer to that and when I step out on the field now and especially like in training and stuff like that, I remember first like I said at the start when I first came into the first team like I, was, I felt like there was a lot of pressure on me yeah like, just do this do that make sure you don't make any mistakes here and there whereas like I'm getting to a space where it comes with maturity as well whereas like if I make a mistake, it doesn't matter. Like, just be yourself, do what you want to do, have fun, like, do what you enjoy. And mm. ever since I've done that, I'm enjoying my football so much more, man. Like, I get on the pitch, and obviously, I have the team has tactics and stuff like that, and we're trying to play a certain way and stuff like that. So obviously, you follow those those rules and try to help your team and stuff like that. But like, when I'm out wide on the wing, like, do a step over, man. Like, have some fun, enjoy it. Like, do a trick or something like that. Don't just be like a robot. Yeah, I'm I'm getting closer and closer to that to that space where I feel like when you get to that that headspace, that's mm. when yeah you become you play superior. Your best. Yeah, you, you play, play your best, best yeah. because you know at the end of the day, you, you think back about when you were younger. You were playing your best when you're with your mates, yeah. kicking the ball around the park, right. or just you know under nines, under twelves. Mm. You know that's when you're playing your best. So I can imagine how difficult it must to cultivate that environment in a professional type of yeah. um, a setting mm. um, and how mu- how difficult it must be for you breaking into that first team, just trying to make sure you do the right things to stay there and not, you know, not trying to fuck anything up. Mm. I think what you were saying as well in terms of if you miss a penalty, you're still going to go home. You know, nothing's going to change. Mm. I think we have a, an inflated sense of self that this mistake will be the worst mistake ever. No one's ever done something bad or whatever yeah. it may be. And I guess you can go two ways. The world's very the world's very big and we are very insignificant. Mm. So you can look at that in two ways. Either, you know, what's the point of doing anything? Or yeah. you can look at it in the way of, Wow, I can I can do whatever I like and really the repercussions Nothing. it's not that big. Minimal man. It's not that big. I know. So in terms of that's at the A League level, let's say you make it to that large level, mm. there is promotion, there is relegation, there is millions of people watching. Yeah. How do you feel like you'd be able to deal with that? The the pressure obviously becomes a little bit more. Mm. Um, but I still feel like the repercussions and all of that isn't as it's it's bigger than what it is now obviously but like it's still not not the end of the world you know like you're a professional footballer if you make a mistake on the field it's not really gonna make much of a difference there's people overseas that are like they're, they're fighting for their lives mm. they're fighting for their lives really um it's like that what we were saying about earlier those lessons from your time in south yeah. sudan that maybe you didn't realize then yeah they're all to, starting to click yeah. now like people are going to work to like to feed their family like if they don't go to work they don't get the money like their kid's not going to eat mm. you know like if i don't go to training i'm still going to have money to go home and get food or whatever and stuff like that i'm still going to have hot water a shower and stuff like that, a bed to sleep in and stuff like that 
Um, puts a lot of things in perspective, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, puts everything in perspective. And I think, yeah, like you said, when you get to those next levels, you s- the people that have the, that, that clear mind and are able to just, you know, play free are the ones that are the best players in the world. What would you tell a younger Cassini growing up and in, in, in about the journey? Because I could imagine now that you're a professional footballer, there's a lot of things that maybe took you by surprise. Maybe there's a lot of components of being a pro footballer that you don't enjoy. So mm-hmm. audio, what would you tell a younger Cassini? I'd tell him to um, just work extremely hard. Mm-hmm. One thing you need is like work ethic. Just mm-hmm. work really hard. There's that quote that like talent beats. Or hard, work hard work beats talent. talent. talent doesn't yeah. work hard. It's yeah, a classic, it's, my it's, friend. It's, 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 true. it's so true, <laughs> man. It's, true. it's so true, bro. Like if you're the best player and you don't work hard, then no one's going to really want you. But if you're like a real hard worker and you can do better than the guy who has talent, then everyone's going to want you. But if you have talent and you work hard, you then... Unstoppable. Yeah, unstoppable, man. Yeah, unstoppable. So like just work really hard and like don't let anyone get in your way. I feel like a lot of people um, in Australia, a lot of players and stuff like that always seem to find an excuse for like, oh, this happened so I didn't get here or this did this or this person didn't like me this is like you just got to keep going when I was growing up there was always kids that were better than me I was never the best player in like maybe in a few teams I played in I was the best player or best player or whatever but those were like smaller teams when I got to like the state teams and stuff I was never the best player there was always kids that were better than me but I think I was the kid who was just the most resilient when I got, got knocked down I got back up you know if I didn't get into a team I kept on going and like in my spare time I would work hard and I tried to make sure that there was no reason why I couldn't get selected into a team or something like that. And if you just if you just keep going, keep knocking down one door at a time, one door at a time, you'll eventually get there. If you give up, you got no chance. No. Yeah. What you're talking about in regards to players making excuses, uh, I do notice that as well in terms of some populations having that victim mentality. Mm. And I think sure. maybe it's because I'm a, a migrant. Um, the way we deal with challenges is a bit different mm. i think you use the word resilience which mm. i think is the perfect word to use mm. um and i think because we have those perspectives of people back at home yeah. that we know that the barriers that are here of course it's relative if no one's ever experienced what you know we've experienced back at home this mm. would be the biggest barrier they have but because we've had those experiences and exposures we don't see it as a an ending obstacle it's just something to move past yeah beyond football Obviously, you play a pretty big role in terms of racism and trying to stamp out racism. And for South Sudan, what would you like to achieve beyond football? Because you seem, for me, it seems like you're, well, you are a very intelligent man. You know the impact that you can have. And football is just the medium and the yeah. d- device for you to have that impact. So what would you like to do beyond football? And what's the impact that you'd like to have on people? So many things. Yeah. So many things. Like I spend so much time thinking in my own head. I spend a lot of my time by myself. Like I said, when I do my double sessions and stuff in the afternoons, mm. I'm always by myself. I spend a lot of time just thinking about what I want to do with my life when I'm older, away from football. Like I've always, I'm already thinking like, oh, what I want to do after football, um, what I want to do while I'm in football and stuff like that. And there's so many people around the world that, you know, I, I look up to like a LeBron James, like mm. he, he built his school. I know he's got a school in like mm. Akron, Ohio and for like the kids there and Marcus Rashford, what he did with racism and like the meals for all the kids in the UK during the pandemic. And I read his book and stuff like that. And I'm always trying to think of like what I want to do. Like I, I really want to set up like a foundation, just help as many people as I can. But that's, you know, it's a diff- difficult task and like you got to narrow it down to like what exactly you want to mm. do. And there's so many different aspects of my life that I feel like when I was younger, if I had this, maybe I could have done this better. And I want the next kids that come after me to, you know, have those opportunities yeah. and stuff like that. But it's like, I spend a lot of time thinking about it, man. Like, do I want to go build a school over in South Sudan? But is that going to be beneficial for them? Mm-hmm. Like, am I just going to build a school and kids aren't really going to go to school or blah, blah, blah. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what I want to do. There's so many things I want to do in my life apart from football. Like I, I love like doing photo shoots and stuff. Like mm-hmm. that. I love to, I'd love to model and something like that as well, or maybe in a movie one day or something like that. And then I also want to start like a foundation and stuff. Like that. So I'm always in my own head, spend a lot of time just thinking about what I want to do when I'm older and what I want to achieve. And obviously my focus is on my footballing. That's my number one thing. I know that being a professional footballer and if I get to where I want to get to in football, then, um, the opportunities and the amount of people I'll be able to help and influence will be, you know, ridiculous. So I'm, um, I'm trying to prepare myself and get myself ready for when I get to that, to that moment. I can really have a big impact on, you know, a lot of people. I think it's good that 
obviously you're still very early on your career, but I think it's good that you have those thoughts beyond football because I feel as though a lot of people, when you hear about it after retirement, they have this uh, depression that they fall into because, again, mm. all their value has been attached to their profession. And as soon as that's taken away from them, they don't know who they are, they don't have a purpose. So it seems like, you, you know, you've got you, your goals after football, which mm. is really good to hear. I guess my final question is, Cassini Yangi, when are we going to see you on the pitch again, my friend? <laughs> it's, it's, I'm hoping the next home game. Beautiful. Which is on the 23rd. Nice. Um, I'm hoping. I've done a session with the team so far, but I keep having these little nickels in my quad. But um, I'm hoping the next home game. Um, I really want to, you know, play some games this season. I really want to score my first goal at High Marsh at Cooper's. I haven't scored at home yet. So oh no, yeah, you haven't. I haven't scored at home. Be Every goal's been away, so it's sensational. been sensational. I want to know what it feels like to score at home. I want to celebrate with my with my fans, and I want my mum to see a, me score a goal at home. So yeah, I, I'm hoping that I get back this season and the boys do well, and hopefully we make finals as well. Mm. We're right on the edge of there around fifth, sixth. So hopefully we make finals and I get to play more games and. Hopefully we win a championship. But hopefully I'm on the field next home game. Beautiful. Well, I'll be right there behind the Red Army with my top off. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Cassini. It's much appreciated. You've, uh, I really appreciate your vulnerability. I know some of the things you've spoken about can be difficult to speak about because I've had those sh shared experiences and it's not easy. So I really appreciate you opening up and I hope to see you soon. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.